Okay, we're gonna give a. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do this all uh, relatively quickly. This is the we week two lecture, um, and I'm gonna try to do this uh, relatively quickly, and then one uh, take here, and so as opposed to having a whole bunch of videos. Uh, how I'm gonna do this? Kind of let me uh, show you here. Let's look. No, we won't look at this. Uh, just to kind of give you guys a look at. Uh, what we have for this week. So week two, this is the lecture presentation uh, here. And what I want to do is, uh, I'm not going to go through this and read this all to you, but I'm going to go over a few things. There's a lot of information in there. I want you to read it. Uh, and, you know, you should be able to just right in the window here, uh, toggle through uh, the information. And I apologize, this was when I was brand new to Prezi. And so I might give you motion sickness. But I'll have you go ahead and go through and read that. And then I'm just going to talk to you about uh, the kind of the important parts, the, the things that I think are a little bit more complex and that I need to elaborate on, I'm going to kind of talk through on this video. So uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to do a, let me go through the itinerary. This is the itinerary that I have for this right here, is I'm going to go through uh, talking about just basically what exposure is, uh, which is pretty important, obviously, to photography. Last week, we kind of touched on it. I talked about light and the amount of time that it take, took for a photograph to be created early in uh, history with photography. Now, I want to elaborate on that and really get you guys hopefully to the point where you understand. So uh, what is exposure? And then what is the meter? What does the meter look like? And how do you know that your meter is giving you an exposure that will result in a photograph? We're going to talk about what a stop is. And then we're going to get into technical considerations, uh, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. We talked, a, I kind of briefly went over uh, some of these last week, and I'll continue to talk about it. So we're going to talk about uh, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO from the technical considerations. And then we're also going to start to talk about creative applications as well. And then as we uh, get through that, we're going to talk about uh, something called reciprocity. Uh, with This is all to do with exposure. And then I'm going to go over uh, a, a copy of the exposure log uh, to just kind of talk about what my expectations are. Uh, because part of you know what we're doing with this class is we're getting very deliberate with exposure. We talked about going beyond you know automatic settings on your camera, and in order to do that, you really have to understand the the light that is going to come through uh, and how to manipulate that light so that you not only get the correct amount of light so that you capture the photograph but that you uh, also can do the things creatively with your photography that you want to do. Okay, so let's just, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll start talking about uh, what exposure is. Okay, so exposure is uh, creating the right conditions, the right lighting conditions, so that you can capture a photograph. Um, I'm sure you've all seen photographs where the photograph is too dark, it's too light. And there's a number of reasons why each of those would, why these things happen. Um, so understanding uh, how, how to read your meter and how to manipulate the amount of light that comes into your camera is really important. So uh, exposure is, uh, for any given photograph that you want to take, there is a particular amount of light that you need to allow into the camera so that that image will actually be created. If there is not enough light, your image will come out uh, too dark or even completely black, okay? And if the image is uh, too bright, you're, you know, if, if we allow in too much light as opposed to not enough, then the image will be completely white. Uh, and I want to try to, you know, just kind of create a couple of images to just let you, you know, give you a basic idea. So what I have here is, I'm going to show you this, guys, a couple of times. So this is the back of a 
digital camera. Uh, and the meter on this digital camera is right here. Okay. Now I want to show you what happens when I when I push down the shutter. You see how that little dot is coming up. Okay. That is telling us information about our exposure. Okay. So this is the meter. And I'm shooting on manual, I can tell because I'm on the M here. And when I push the shutter down, it's telling me that I don't have enough light to take the photograph that I want to take. It will be underexposed. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to take an un underexposed photograph really quick. Okay. And I'm going to show you. Okay, so now it's giving me a preview. Here, I'll go if I get that preview back. So this is the preview, and it's totally black. There was not enough light for that image to be successfully captured. The exposure was not correct, okay? I didn't get enough light into the camera. So now I'm going to uh, manipulate the settings on the camera and uh, get more light into the camera. I'm going to actually purposely overexposed now. Okay, so now I'm looking at the back of the camera and I've manipulated the, the settings. And when I push the shutter down, you can see now it's over on the plus three side. So, you know, right in the middle is the correct exposure. Minus is not enough light. Plus is too much light. So now I have the camera set up that it's getting, it's going to get too much light. Okay, so I'll take a, a quick photograph to illustrate. Okay, so I took a photograph of some, excuse me, sorry about that. I took a quick photograph of some objects on my desk, and you can see here the image is completely, almost completely blown out. So it's, it's, just, it's just very, very white. All right, so that's not the correct exposure as well, okay? So, so exposure, getting the right exposure is to say that you're creating the correct conditions with your camera, within your camera, to um, accurately capture the correct amount of light to take that particular photograph. Now, the, those settings are going to change all the time because different lighting conditions are going to give us, uh, you know, different amounts of lights. So it changes all the time, okay? So that's the, the basic idea behind, if, you know, of an ex what an exposure is. The or more, you know, to the point, the correct exposure, if you will. Uh, so um, we are basically using the controls on our camera to... Uh, manipulate the amount of light that comes into the camera so that the camera can so that the camera has enough light to create an image okay um, so uh, now let's talk about how we can tell when we're looking at our camera whether or not we are creating the appropriate image and we've already started to look at this uh, uh, when we were going through that little basic demo of what an exposure is Okay, so here I'm looking at the back of the camera, and most digital cameras, you can actually get this kind of uh, information. So you can see here, this is the meter. Now, I can also get that meter information uh, inside the viewfinder of the camera, but I can't show you the inside of the, through the viewfinder of the camera with this video, okay? So all meters on cameras are going to be different, but... Uh, this is what most digital camera meters are going to look like. So I push the shutter down, or the shutter trigger halfway down, and now it's indicating there's not enough light. Okay, so now I can manipulate the shutter set, the the camera settings, and I can move that little dot. Do you see what's happening there? Okay, what's happening is you can see actually up here I'm changing the shutter speed on the camera and as I change the shutter speed on the camera the little dot on the meter is moving back and forth okay so when it's in the middle that would be a correct exposure for the particular image that I'm shooting shooting at that given moment 
Okay, now let's look at some other things on this particular meter, all right? So right in the middle, that's the correct exposure, and then you see 1, 2, 3, minus, 1, 2, 3, plus, okay? So we're going to introduce another topic here, um, um, and we'll talk more about it uh, after I just give you the basic idea of what a meter does, is that, you know, the minus means not enough light, the plus means too much light. The numbers actually correspond to what are called stops, okay? Uh, so if I'm at the one, I am one stop overexposed. If, I'm sorry, if I'm at the one on the positive side, I'm at one stop overexposed. If I'm at one on the negative side, I'm one stop underexposed, and so on and so forth. So. You know, the two on this side and the negative side would be two stops underexposed. The three would be three stops underexposed. Okay, so that's what a basic digital meter looks like. Now, not all of you are going to be shooting digital for this class. In fact, most of you, I assume, are probably not going to have access to a digital SLR, and you're going to be shooting something like this a Pentax K1000. Now, unfortunately, I really can't show you what the meter looks like in here. I can describe the meter to you in this particular camera. Uh, now, meters in uh, digital or film cameras uh, are going to vary quite a bit. Digital cameras are pretty much all the same, very, very, very close, if not exactly the same at this point. It's almost like we've kind of come to a point of de facto uh, standard with how the meters work. But with uh, uh, Film cameras, the meters are all over the place. They run the gamut. I have seen uh, just about any type of meter you can imagine. Um, I've seen meters. Let me let me first. I'm going to describe what the meter in this Pentax uh, K1000 uh, looks like first, because this is actually a pretty good, uh, simple meter. Okay. Now, in the Pentax K1000, you're going to look through the viewfinder, and if you look through the viewfinder, you're going to see a needle on the right-hand side of the viewfinder, okay? Now, the meter goes just basically up and down as you manipulate the settings on the camera, okay? If the needle is pointed up, there's too much light. It's pretty simple. It doesn't tell you how many stops. It's just too much light, and then you'll move your settings until it comes to the middle okay if it's right in the middle that's the correct or a correct exposure for that particular photograph if the needle is pointed down then that is not enough light it's underexposed okay so you would manipulate the settings again until the needle is in the middle of the uh, the uh, right hands of the screen, okay? Um, I, I might be having some audio issues. It looks like I have a little bit of a delay. I hope that that's not coming across on the other end, and, hope, and if it is, I hope it's not too much of a distraction. We'll just see how it goes. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, a, what a, a simple meter looks like, okay? So just that little needle arm up and down, okay? Now, like I said, all, there's all kinds of other meters. Um, I've seen uh, meters in a film camera where it has, you know, lights that light up along the side to tell you how, you know, whether or not you have enough light. Uh, I've seen meters where you set the shutter speed and you uh, push the shutter trigger halfway down, and that that when you push the shutter trigger halfway down, that's what will actually trigger the meter in most cameras. So you push the shutter trigger halfway down, and then the meter oh, smudge there. Hey, there, that's better. <laughs> Having all kinds of fun technical difficulties today with this stuff. Okay, so uh, when you push the shutter trigger halfway down, that will actually uh, signal to the camera, I want to take a photograph, please meter the light. Okay, so on some cameras, like I said, you set the shutter speed, you push the shutter trigger, trigger halfway down, and it will actually then flash an aperture at you. It will say, okay, 
with these lighting conditions, if your shutter speed is at what you want to be at right now, you need to set your aperture to f8, for, in, for instance. Okay? Uh, so there's a number of different uh, types of meters out there. So what I want to talk about with you know the types of meters, you know, one of the things we need to be doing this week is, you know, hopefully you've you you have a camera, you either check one out for me or you have one. Um, and now, you know, you, you've hopefully found your uh, owner's manual or, you know, either a hard copy or online. I'm sure you've heard of this thing called the Internet. Your camera manual is out there. Um, so we got to get, get to know our equipment. All right. Now, for some of you, it's going to be easy. It's going to be, you know, some one of the meters that I've described. For some of you others, like I said, I've seen, you know, so many different types of meters. Uh, I mean, I've probably looked at, you know, somewhere around 100 different models of camera. And uh, some of them are, they make perfect sense, and others are a little bit tricky. Okay, so you need to figure out how your meter works and practice manipulating your meter. You know, increasing the sh and decreasing the shutter speed and aperture. Talking more about that here in a second. Talked a little bit about it last week. We'll keep on talking about it. Um, if you have a camera, if you run into a camera that you're just really not sure how this thing works and you need help with the meter, please make an appointment with me to uh, talk to me about that uh, and I'll you know, help you out and get you squared away. Chances are it shouldn't take too much. You know, I've had a couple of cameras that are that have left me perplexed, but most of them I can figure out pretty quickly. Okay, so that's the basics of, you know, of, you know, the beginning idea of exposure, okay? So exposure being there is uh, an amount of light that you need to capture an image, and your meter is how you determine whether or not you actually have the conditions correct in your camera to get that correct exposure, okay? So the next thing we're going to talk about, and I've already talked about it once, is this term a stop, okay? And you may have heard of this uh, before. In fact, it's really common for people uh, who are professional photographers or in the industry or they want to sound smart to say f-stop, which kind of is, I don't know, F-stop just means one stop of aperture, okay? The F number is the aperture number, okay? So, but, but what is a stop really? Okay, what does that mean? What is a stop, okay? A stop is actually a really simple concept. We're talking really basic mathematics here, okay? A stop is a doubling or halving of light. That's it. That's all it is. Okay, so if I'm going to uh, increase my whatever by one stop, I'm increasing the amount of light that is going to come into the camera and affect that film or sensor by two. And if I'm dis decreasing the exposure by a stop, I am cutting the light in half. That's it. That's all it is. Just multiplying and dividing by two. Okay? And in some ways, it's going to make perfect sense when we look at some of these number representations of uh, what the technical uh, stops are. Now, one of the interesting things about stops is a lot of, every, a lot of people understand f-stop. They know that that's, you know, an aperture stop. Okay? But stop applies to each of the three things that we use to control light or control our exposure in the camera. All right. So the three things are the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. And we're going to take a look at those next the technical considerations here. Okay. So let me switch cameras and we'll see how this goes. So back to the idea of stop, and I'll uh, and then I'll kind of show you a camera here in a moment. Um, so if these blocks, and you can actually see here, I have numbers written here to represent different stops. Okay, so um, these are actually would be our aperture numbers across the bottom here. 
and I'm going to come back to this little silly thing. And I apologize. I'm trying something new here. Okay, so if this is a rep representation of aperture here, okay, so you can see here, you know, this is, we're going to call that F8. That's F56. These are aperture numbers. F4 and F2.8, okay? So there is one stop of light between 2.8 and 4. So if I cut my aperture from 2.8 to 4, I am effectively cutting the amount of light coming into the camera in half. If I cut from... 4 to 5.6, cutting my app, decreasing my aperture by one stop. I'm again cutting the aperture, the amount of light coming in in half. And then from 5.6 to f8, that's another stop. I've cut the light in half again. Okay. If I go move the other direction, I'm just doubling. So eight. 5.6 double okay 5.6 to 4 I've doubled and then 4 to 2.8 again I've doubled okay and don't worry why I have extra blocks here because I'm gonna that's a, for a, a exercise a little bit later to try to uh, help you understand exposure a little bit better okay so uh, what I want to show you here first is the standard stops, the technical considerations and how this works. Okay, so this is a the Pentax K1000. And you can see here on this dial, those are our standard shutter speed stops. Okay, and if you look there, you can see that they are basically multiples of two. They're, you know, uh, multiplying or dividing by two. Okay, so we have uh, one second, which is a little tough to see because it's right next to the ISO here. Then we have one, the two, actually now, when we go from the, the one, one is a full second. So basically all these numbers are whatever number it is uh, as, as the, uh, basically the, uh, the denominator. Uh, the numerator is just going to be 1. So it's 1 over 1 is 1 second. 1 over 2, a half second. A quarter second, an eighth of a second. A fifteenth of a second, a thirtieth of a second, a sixtieth of a second. And then you can see how here it kind of jumps. It gets you know from 8 to 15th. It doesn't make perfect sense. Um, and from 160th to 125th. Or, I'm sorry. 160th to 1 125th, it doesn't make perfect sense. And uh, But then all the other numbers are basically just multiplying or dividing by 2. Okay, So those are our standard uh, shutter speeds. So let's talk about, you know, uh, very briefly, it, it makes uh, what, you're, what you have happening there. Um, if I am... Let's say I'm sitting at a, a, a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second, okay? But it's not enough light, all right? I'm, the image is, you know, too dark by a stop, okay? By changing my shutter speed from a 60th of a second to 1 30th of a second, that's twice the amount of time. So you see, really, if you see here, uh, shutter speed makes perfect sense. I'm just opening the shutter for a longer period of time, which then allows me to get more light into the camera, into onto the film. So this would be a representation of a 60th of a second. And I took the uh, lens off so you could see the mirror move. This is a 60th of a second. Okay, pretty quick. And here's a 30th of a second. Okay, still pretty quick, but it was. Uh, I'll, I'll show you again. We'll go. We'll go to a fifteenth of a second, but twice as long each time. So this is a fifteenth of a second. Okay, and you can see, you heard the, the snapping that time. How much slower the snapping was, 
and it's twice as much time each time. Okay, that's an eighth, a quarter. Okay, much slower now. You can really see it, okay? So basically, each time you move up or down a stop in shutter speed, it is multiplying by two the amount of light that's coming in or cutting the amount of light that's com coming in by half. Now, one of the things that you're going to have to you know, get used to with this is remembering uh, basically you know, on, on the numbers, you know, which direction's which. Like, okay, on the dial, it shows, you know, it says, you know, one, and it says 500 and 1,000. Well, going from 500 to 1,000 is less light. It might seem for a moment like it's, you're actually putting more light in, 1,000 is a larger number, but you have to remember that it's one over 1,000, okay? Uh, and that should help you out quite a bit. So, uh, but shutter speed, again, we uh, decrease the speed, we make it slower to allow more light in, we speed it up, make it faster to cut light down. And this is all very just, that's just surface, that's just technical, that's just getting the exposure correct, all right? Now, the next thing that we have on the camera that I want to talk about the technical considerations for is the aperture. Okay, and now the aperture, let me switch cameras again. We'll see if we can make this. I'm trying to make the, get a better picture here by using a different lens or a different camera. So this here is, you can see here, this is the aperture ring. Okay, and you can, this is the indicator right here, this red line that indicates uh, what your aperture is set at. So that's 2.8. 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, and 22, okay? Now, aperture numbers are a little goofy, all right? They're a little harder to understand because aperture numbers are actually uh, the opening of the lens, which you can see here, all right? So this is actually, that's an f22. Now, the numbers themselves don't quite make sense because the numbers aren't perfect. Uh, they're not multiples of two. Actually, we have kind of almost like two sets of ring numbers. Like, you know, we have 4, 8, and 16, and then 2.8, 5.6, 11, and 22. And then there's, of course, there's more numbers that you saw. Hopefully, you read in the lecture. If not, you're going to read. But so aperture is one of those things you just have to memorize. And the... As part of memorizing, you'll also hopefully begin to see that the numbers are, they're kind of uh, backward, okay? So what I mean by that is, you can see here, this is an F2.8, okay? So the smallest number, but the widest aperture. You see how the, at the lens opened up, okay? So more light comes in to the lens when we're on a smaller number on the aperture, okay? So, but the aperture, the technical uh, here is that what we're looking for is that basically we are increasing and decreasing that iris you're looking at by a half or uh, multiplying it by two each time we uh, change the stops here. So here's, this is an F22. That's an F16. So you can see the difference between 22 and 16. And 16 is twice as large as uh, 22. Now from 16 to 11. From, oops, sorry, that's actually, there's 11. And then uh, uh, 11 to 8. 8 to 5, 6. 5, 6 to Four, and then 4 to 2.8. Okay, so each time that I manipulate the aperture ring, I'm opening or closing that aperture, and 
going in for half the amount of light. Okay, so um, how these work together? Okay, uh, the thing I like to try to talk to people about to try and help them understand aperture and shutter speed is uh, running water in a faucet. Okay, think of the ex uh, the correct exposure as a glass that you want to fill with water. Okay, and then think of the aperture of your lens being how much you open the water tap. Do you turn it full blast so lots of water is coming in? Or do you just turn it on a trickle? And so there's just a little drip, drip, drip. So wide aperture or small aperture. And then the shutter speed is the time that it takes to fill the glass, okay, so how, or how long you leave that faucet on, okay? So, you know, if you, you know, let's, let's use the analogy of you, you're, you have that faucet open, doesn't matter, you know, you, you've got open a full blast. If you leave that faucet on for a second, you know, you have a certain amount of water that will come out of the faucet. If you leave that faucet open for two seconds, you've now doubled the amount of water. Four seconds, you've doubled the amount of water again. Eight seconds, doubled the water amount of water again, and so on and so forth. And of course, you can go the other direction. Half a second, half the amount of water. Quarter second, half the amount of water again. Eighth of a second, half the amount of water again. All right? So aperture and shutter speed are the, kind of the same thing. Uh, well, not, I mean, they're, they're analogous, I guess you should say, to you know how you fill a glass with water. The aperture is how much you're, you're opening the faucet tap, and the shutter speed is how long you're running that water, okay? And we'll come back, we'll probably come back to that idea when we talk about, uh, later on we're going to talk about reciprocity. And we're going to talk about how, uh, you know, shutter speed and aperture work together and why a understanding what a stop is is important, okay? Um, so uh, now let's talk about the third uh, technical consideration, and that's the ISO, okay? Now, ISO is kind of an interesting thing uh, because it applies to film in the exact same way that it applies to digital, okay? So nothing's changed. Uh, in film, ISO refers to the sensitivity of the film, okay? So this is TMAX 400 I have here. And 400 is an ISO measurement. So that 400 is you know, how sensitive this film is. Okay, now you can get films that are more or less sensitive to light. Uh, you can get film that is 200 ISO, 100 ISO, or you can go the other way, 800 ISO, 1600 ISO. Now, it should be easier here to track ISO numerically because, of course, those are multiples of two. Okay, so, you know, 100 is a, a, a speed of film, a sensitivity of film, film, it's not terribly sensitive, okay? Uh, we actually would use a 100 speed film when we know we're gonna be shooting in lots of light, all right? Uh, as we move from 100 to 200, that the 200 speed film is twice as sensitive as 100 speed film. As we move from 200 to 400 speed film, 400 speed film is twice as sensitive to light as 200 speed film. And it's the exact same thing in a digital camera. But instead of, uh, you know, it's the sensitivity of your film, you now have a sensor in your camera. And you can adjust, you basically can tell your camera how sensitive to light you want your ISO to be. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to warn you about uh, ISO is 
it's not magic. Okay, uh, we'll talk about this when we get into uh, creative applications. Uh, generally, you want to keep your ISO as low as you possibly can. Uh, lower ISOs, uh, and I'll show you an example, create a higher quality image. Okay, so base, there's those there's those three things that we have that uh, we can use together that create the exposure. Okay, so uh, we have you know the shutter speed, how long the shutter is going to be open. We have the aperture, how wide or narrow the opening on the camera is, which of course allows in more or less light as well. And then the sensitivity of our sensor or film. And we can adjust all of these things to create the correct exposure. Okay. But now let's talk about creative applications. Um, and, and I want you guys to be experimenting with it. As you know, you're supposed to be getting to know your camera, so I want you to figure out where you know how your meter works, and then just just play with settings. Just you know, turn your shutter speed up and down, and watch that meter go up and down. Well, you know, move your aperture ring around, and watch the meter go up and down. Okay, so uh, just I, we're we're just trying to get used to uh, how this equipment works and how we can create a manual exposure, okay? And, and really, uh, you know, manual is a, a key term here. We are not shooting automatic in this class, all right? Because when you shoot automatic, you're giving away uh, all your creative control, all right? All right, so creative applications. Why does this matter, okay? So I'm going to show you, what I want to do is I want to go through and talk about, show you guys some examples of some images and show you some things that you've probably seen and thought, hey, that's great. How do I do that? And now we'll talk about why understanding uh, your shutter aperture uh, at ISO are important from a creative standpoint. And I'm going way too long on this. All right, so uh, I'm going to switch to screen sharing again. OK, so let's talk shutter first. Now, I want you guys to see here. I have, I use Pinterest to kind of curate uh, you know, things visually to help people out uh, as far as like, you know, inspiration uh, for photography. And you, you'll see a number of things here like, you know, and impact. These are, these are some of the things we'll look at when we get into talking about composition. Okay. So um, let's talk about, we're going to talk about shutter speed first. Okay. So bring up my board here for shutter speed. And I want to show you some images. Oops, I have, let's edit this one. I have that on there twice. There's no reason for me to have that twice. Okay, so I want to talk to you, to you about how to create different types of images and how shutter speed helps you to create these really fun, creative things, okay? So shutter speed, in addition to helping us control exposure, it also helps us to control motion in our photograph, okay? So let's look at this one here to start with. Okay, so this is a fun image. Okay, we have these great, you know, geometric ob objects, these uh, water spheres dropping off the bottom. This, we've stopped this splash here, and it's really fun, okay? But how do you do that, all right? So one of the creative controls that shutter speed gives us is it essentially gives us the ability to stop motion, all right? If our shutter speed is fast enough, we can stop something like this in its tracks, right? So a fast shutter speed, okay? Uh, when I talk about a fast shutter speed, I'm usually talking about a shutter speed that is faster than, uh, let's say, 1 250th, uh, 250th of a second or faster. And I don't have the data on this one, so I can't tell you how fast this is. But I'm going to guess that this is somewhere, it's so clean, this has got to be one one thousandth of a second or faster, all right? Uh, so what basically the idea here is that the shutter is open, we have enough light, and the shutter is open for such a short period of time that this is the only thing that the camera sees. So it freezes that motion. So, and there's all kinds of great applications here. You know, we have something fun like this, but then we also have, you know, sports photography. How do you make, how do great photographers get 
uh, you know, these those wonderful uh, images where you know they stop someone who's you know laid out for a, a a touchdown pass or something. I don't have any sports photography examples here. Uh, darn it. Okay, um, but there's a flip side of that. Okay, let me show you some other fast shutter images. This is a fast shutter image. That shutter speed is. I'm going to guess somewhere around one five hundredth of a second. Okay, your shutter speed has to be pretty fast in order to stop something like that. Okay, let's look for more fast shutter speed. This is a very fast shutter speed. You know, basically, it, we, we're making this look like we have some sort of levitation here. That's a fast shutter speed again. All right, and now let's let's go. I've given you some examples. Of what we can do with fast shutter speed let's look at some fun stuff with slow shutter speed okay uh, first of all one of the things we can do this is actually an example of panning and we can actually see there's a, there's a reason why i have this and i'll talk about this more when we get into sports photography so panning is one of the fun things that we can do with uh, shutter speed and you can see the the information here okay so panning is the idea that you follow your subject so your subject is in re reasonable focus, but your shutter speed is low enough, like you know here a fifteenth of a second, that things do blur from motion. You can see here her feet are blurring, this reflector is blurred, and then look at that great line motion she gets in the background. Uh, so this is a, a, what we call a panning shot, and then you can see here this is one of the things th fun things about stops and panning. You're going to see this multiple of two idea over and over and over again in photography and one of the places that you'll see it again is that in panning notice that this it's it's you can't like measure it necessarily but you see how there's more motion showing in this image than there is in this image when you slow your sp shutter speed by one stop so by half you double the motion you get in a panning shot I think that's a really fun thing. So mathematically, you can kind of have some predictors. So if she was going the same speed in both these photographs, the panning lines in this image, which should be essentially twice as long as they are in this image, okay? And then you can see here as it gets even faster. So look at, uh, I think a good thing to look at would like the feet and the reflector. So a 15th of a second, the feet is pretty soft. And then a 60th of a second, they're about stopped. And the, but the panning isn't as great here. But panning is a fun slow shutter example. Okay. Let's look at some other things here. And I want to show you some, some things that are more just kind of simple uh, shutter things here. Uh, photographs like these ones where you've seen where the, you know, the light trails of cars are going through the image. That's a slow shutter speed. This is probably a few seconds at a minimum. So the shutter is actually open for not just like a 15th of a second, but, you know, we're probably talking, I would have to guess uh, this has got to be four seconds or more, okay? Uh, and I take photographs with extended shutter speeds all the time, okay? Uh, so here's a, another of those same types of photograph. You know, the landscape is in perfect sharp focus because they're using a tripod but the car moved by so fast that it's blurred. Okay, um, light painting. This is an example of light painting. So basically they set the camera up, they open the shutter, and then they use like a flashlight or something else to paint lines and to illuminate an object. Okay, so that's an extended uh, shutter speed or a long shutter speed. Okay, uh, another one of these great uh, kind of urban landscape uh, this is, you know, basically an idea of a panning shot again, okay? So the camera is moving with the swings, but the world around spinning. Okay, now here's a difference, a couple different types of uh, extended shutter speed images. So we remember the flower image. This was a fast shutter image, okay? But what happens if we view the same type of image, but we open the shutter up and we leave it open for a long period of time? So here you can see that's what gives this this soft blurred effect, okay? All of those grains falling gives it that soft 
blurred effect. Okay, uh, water images where you see that soft effect in the uh, the water. Okay, this is basically we're seeing all kinds of motion in the water. So that's an extended shutter. Uh, astronomy photo photographs where you can see basically the uh, the or the uh, turning of the Earth. That's what we're seeing here. This is the Earth turning. This is and this exposure is pretty impressive. Uh, because, you know, there's one of two things happening here. Either the photographer has composited this image, which is possible, because a, a lot of photographers who do this type of photography, they'll actually take several photographs and put them together. But um, I can tell you, because I actually recently did some photography around Perseids, uh, and this is, uh, Perseids is a meteor shower, uh, and this, I would say, I had a, a exposure, it was about 10 minutes long, and the the lines were about as you can see my mouse moving here so if that was a, if mine was a 10 minute exposure i mean just uh, a wild guess this is possibly a half hour exposure okay so you can create some really dramatic effects another example of oh cancel another example of what happens when you have a long open shutter with running water here again so lots of really incredible things we can do if we take the time to understand and control our shutter speed. So that's shutter speed creative applications. By slowing down or speeding up our shutter, we can begin to make decisions about aesthetically how these things, oops, that's not what I wanted. Let's go back to my boards. How these things are going to appear. Okay, uh, let's look at, uh, so in the lecture it talks about depth of field. An aperture ha is actually uh, a, a, uh, one of the ways that we control depth of field. So, do I have a deep depth of field? Okay, well, I'll show you some. Uh, nope, that's not the right <laughs> board, excuse me. All right, so let me show you some shallow depth of field images, and hopefully you'll begin to see, you know, again, uh, how we can control and what this gives allows us creatively. So, you know, just some really interesting, fun images. So, um, shallow depth, uh, well, this, uh, this is a good one. It's, it's sharp, but it's sharp in an area that you really can't see anything here. So, with aperture and a couple of other things, like it says in the lecture, you can control depth of field. And so, depth of field is the uh, essentially the area that's in a set, uh, acceptable focus. Okay, and let me, let's do, I'm actually going to do a quick visual here, if I can. No, that's not what I want. Oh, you know, it's because I'm trying to do two things at once here. Okay, so let's, yes, just a moment here, and I'll get my stuff together. I'm going to try to bring up something I can draw on here. Give me a moment so I can give you a better representation. Hopefully you got some of this when we were looking at the lecture. All right. Okay. And here we go. All right. Okay, so shallow depth of field, or depth of field, uh, more to the point, uh, is there's an area... So if this is the focal plane, there is an area in front of and behind of the focal plane that is going to be an acceptable focus, okay? And there's a few different ways we control that, all right? We can control that with our aperture. We can control that from with the distance from our subject, and we can control that uh, with uh, the uh, focal length of our of our camera, okay, the, the lens on our camera, okay. So we can choose to have a compressed depth of field or a very deep depth of field, and all of the area within would be in focus, okay. We can control that, all right. Okay screen share again so let's get some images 
Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm going to skip this one. It's a fun example, but it's not a great example. But here, I want to show you. This is actually, this is a, something that someone did that kind of just shows, uh, you know, how we can move the depth of field around in an image so that, you know, just the subject we want is in focus. That's a great, a great uh, creative application. Uh, and there's a number of different applications here that we might want to use that for. Uh, one of like really standard easy application is like portrait photography. As we get to talking about composition, we'll talk about how you want to simplify the background of a photograph. Okay, and one of the ways you can simplify the background of a photograph is by controlling the depth of field. But then, of course, you can see there's some really interesting things you can do creatively as well here. So you can see here it is sharp right here. Uh, very close to the camera, and then is so soft as we move into the distance that lights just become shapes. And in fact, that's what we call uh, bokeh. Uh, this is actually just a basically a bokeh image. Okay, bokeh basically means that any light, the depth of field is so shallow that any light just basically takes the shape of your aperture. Okay, um, I thought I had better images than this. Let me see if I have another board. Protect the field. Let's see what I did here. Or if I can just find some images that show some varying depths of field. Hmm. All right. Well, I just have a basic photography one here. Let's just go in here so I can show some different. Uh, images and just talk about different depths of field and how they affect each image uh, from a aesthetic perspective. Okay, so here is an image where the subject of the image is, of course, this bicycle. And you can see how the photographer has used the depth of field to create, you know, to so that the, the front of this bicycle is very sharp. And then as we go into the distance, everything gets softer and softer. Okay, so a good example of the use of depth of field. But then sometimes we may want to actually uh, show high detail, a high amount of detail as you uh, move through a frame. So let's see here. Oh, I'm trying to find a fun lens. This is a pretty fun lens. Well, I don't know. So here are some interesting images, uh, and you know I'd call this more of like an urban landscape. And as you can see here, the depth of field is such that the image is sharp from the front of the image all the way to the back. So even up here near the camera, it's very sharp. But then as we look toward the back, the uh, at the, this tree, which is quite a ways away from the uh, camera, the image is still sharp. Okay, so that's a deeper depth of field. So we can choose how, you know, how much we want to show depth. How, oh, here's a really good example of depth of field. Uh, so how much we want to show depth or how much we want to, you know, you know, have if we want to create a soft appearance or feeling with an image or if we want to create uh, a very highly detailed, you know, a sharp image. And, and really, uh, by taking, again, taking these creative control, you can begin to impose some emotional meaning on uh, on your images. Hold on just a second. I have a phone call I need to push off here. Sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully some of these images, and please do, uh, the, the, this Pinterest page is actually uh, something I list as a resource in my uh, syllabus. Here's another example. Here's a good example of deep depth of field. Again, so this would be a wide aperture. I'm sorry, n narrow aperture, as it says in the, the lecture. And then you said. Please find. Oh, here's a really uh, shallow. Oh, actually, here's I like this one. Uh, nice. This is a great shallow depth of field. So um, the, sh the uh, aperture would be very wide on this image. Uh, so you can see here, as you look at this image, this is what I mean by like changing the mood of an image here. Okay, this has that 
uh, idea, you know, obviously it's kind of a, a we're showing the fall, fall colors, but we're also kind of showing the dreariness of uh, fall as well. And the the softness of the of the uh, foreground and the background being uh, out of focus really does a great deal to kind of promoting that that feeling that uh, you know that kind of like dull gray day. Okay, so we can use depth of field to apply emotional meaning to our photographs. Okay, and then again, let me uh, go over this because I I don't think I said this at the beginning. But uh, it says this in the, the uh, text portion of the lecture. Uh, we use aperture to creatively control the, you know, the, the depth of field by using a wide aperture to create a, sh a shallow depth of field and a narrow aperture to create a deep depth of field. So the, what I'm trying to show you here is, is that you know, a lot of people, they're, they're, they don't necessarily see the benefit of moving from shooting automatically with their cameras to shooting manually with their cameras and really understanding what's happening with their cameras. If you understand what's happening with your camera, you can really open up a lot of possibilities uh, as to you know, what you can do creatively with your cameras. And then the last thing I want to show you, and I've got to swap here to a different screen, is... ISO. Okay, so and I, let me see here how this is showing. Okay, let me swap. I just want to con confirm that it's. Oh, you know what? It's not showing. Let me. I'm trying to show you a couple of images here to show you ISO. Come on. Uh oh. Am I having a, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to show the whole screen here because I'm having trouble showing. Okay, so here is, here, I want to show you ISO here. Okay, so ISO creatively, it's not necessarily creative control, although you could use it creatively, but we talked about how as you increase the sensitivity of your uh, film or your sensor, uh, you're actually changing the clarity, the quality of the image, okay? So we use a lower ISO to create a cleaner image. So I want to show you two images here. And I'm zoomed in to 400% on these images so I can show you the difference here, okay? So here, this is an image, 400%, and you can see, you can see the pixels. You can see the pixel information. You can see that there's differentiation in color here, all right? And let me show you. This is, uh, if I go into the final info, you can see the ISO is 400, okay? And then I'm going to show you another image here. And this is, these are both kind of skin tone images. This is obviously shot in some greater light. This was shot in uh, a gymnasium. And it doesn't matter that you see the actual image. Uh, this is 400% on this image as well. And this image, if you look at the final info, was shot at 1600 uh, ISO. And you can really see the difference in these images. And this is, you know, we're only talking from 400 to 1600, although this is, these are images from an older camera. You can just see here how much cleaner, uh, how, how much better the clarity is on this image that was shot with a 400 ISO as compared to this image with a 1600 ISO. All right. I'm making this way too long. Okay, so uh, there's, you know, basically the technical and the kind of creative uh, basics to shutter speed, ISO, and uh, aperture. I'm sorry. No, no, that's right. Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. I just got them out of order, so I was afraid I said aperture twice. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the, I want to talk about two more things. If I look at my little guy here, yep. We're going to talk about reciprocity. And uh, then the, uh, the exposure log, okay? So let's talk about reciprocity first. And I'm going to switch over to other camera. I'm going to show you, hopefully you guys can see this fairly well. I'm going to move this as far as over as I can. Okay. So what I want to show you, the idea here, I'm trying to show you 
and again, this this is kind of similar to that analogy of the, the, the glass of water. The glass of water represents, uh, you know, the, you know, the amount of water you need, you know, necessarily for, for an exposure. Okay. That'd be an example. The other, another example, another way to look at exposure is to look at it as basically volume of light. So let's say here that these blocks actually represent the volume of light that you need for a particular photograph. And if you see here, and then it's tough to see because it's kind of small and I don't have a lot here. But basically what I have here is I've written it out. I have you know, apertures of 8, 5.6, 4, and 2.8. And then if you look on the side here, I have shutter speeds, 500, 1 500th, 250th, uh, 1/125th, and then 1 60th of a second. So I want to show you the, the idea of reciprocity here, okay? So the idea of reciprocity, and this is important, okay, because we have talked about two things. We talked about the technical, you know, how you create the correct exposure, and then the, the second thing, the creative aspect. So if you understand how to control your exposure, you can do things with your shutter speed and aperture that allow you to do certain things creatively, okay? Now, as it says in the lecture, what if I want to create a deeper depth of field in an image, but the exposure I have wouldn't create a deeper depth of field? So if we look at this here, I have f2.8. So in order to create this exposure, I've opened my aperture up all the way to f2.8, and my shutter speed is 1 250th of a second, okay? So what I want to do here is show you reciprocity at work, hopefully in a visual way, so that you can see that when I change the settings, the actual physical space, the physical volume doesn't change, okay? So reciprocity is the basic idea that if I move one stop with one of my settings to increase or decrease the amount of light, I can actually compensate for that stop with my other setting, okay? So we talked about depth of field, and to get a deeper depth of field, we need a, a, a smaller aperture, which is a larger number, okay? So 2.8 is going to create a shallow depth of field, but you know, this is the amount of light I need, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I am going to cut my aperture from 2.8 to 4. So I've gotten rid of that much light. And I'm having trouble moving all these guys here. Okay. So now the problem is, is that I've changed the depth of field. Okay. And in fact, here's another multiple of two fun fact. I've actually deepened the depth of field by the, a multiple of two. But I now have one stop less light than I need. Okay. My image is going to be too dark. Okay, so what do I do? I'm going to add that same volume of light back by changing my shutter speed from 1 250th to 1 125th. The shutter is now open twice as long, and now I have the same 16 blocks, the same volume of light. Well, I want a deeper uh, depth of field still okay so what do i do all right well i'm going to pull my uh aperture i'm going to change my aperture cut it down from f4 to f5.6 i cut this light out but i'm going to bring that light back now and i'm running out of space with all my blocks by changing my shutter speed from 1 125th to 1 60th of a second. I still have the same 16 blocks. It's still the same volume. So I've now gone from an aperture of, uh, excuse me, it's down here, 2.8 to 5.6. So I have actually deepened my depth of field distance by four. 
I've made it four times greater. And I have the same exposure because I manipulated my shutter speed. Okay, And then I can just do the same thing going the other direction. If I want to have a faster shutter speed because 1 60th isn't fast enough for what I want to do, I can open up my aperture to a greater aperture uh, width and then speed up my shutter speed. Now, there's another component here as well. And so that's why I like to use, it's tough to see here, but we have cubes. Okay, they're, they're not actually cubes. They're like little biscuits. So, but we can do the same thing with ISO. Okay, so let's say I want my aperture to be uh, at an f4 because I want to keep a pretty, uh, I, I want a fairly shallow depth of field, but I also really need to speed my uh, shutter speed up to, to stop motion. One 125th isn't going to stop motion. Let's say I'm shooting basketball. I need to get to one 250th of a second to stop motion, but I also want a shallower depth of field that that f4 gives me. I can adjust the ISO. So now, so let's say this, this depth represents an ISO of 400. I can cut my shutter speed down to 1 250th of a second and now increase the sensitivity from 400 ISO to 800. And now you can still kind of see them. I still have the same 16 blocks here. So the volume of light is exactly the same. That's what reciprocity does for us. So if we understand what full, you know, what a stop is, and and that basically we can compensate for light with our aperture and our shutter speed, we can create the conditions that we need to take creative control over our photographs. And that is a really, really important concept. Now that's a tough one, and I'm gonna, we're going to practice that. I'm going to give you guys some exercises to basically uh, kind of calculate some equivalent exposures uh, and as we uh, go through the class. So I'm introducing you to this concept now. If you're not 100% with it, that's okay. We're going to keep talking about it. All right. All right. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is I need to go back to... my other screen here and I'm going to go back into this window and I, oops, I want to show you the exposure log. Okay, so you don't have to do this yet, but I want to get you started with this. Okay, because we're looking at photography and we're going to get really deliberate with things, I want you to write down each exposure that you make. Okay, and let me I'm going to try to bring, I'm going to try and do something that's probably going to make the computer go wiggy one more time, but I'm going to do it anyway. So let me bring this guy up. Give me just a second here. I apologize. I've made this much longer than I intended to, but... I'm not sure if I can do this. Let me try. All right, I'm going to try this. If I can make this smart board stuff work for me here. All right, okay, let me see if I can. All right, All right so what I want you to do is, the idea here is, is that as you go through this, 
I want you to actually write your exposures down. Okay. So as I'm, and uh, right now we, we're not really even taking photographs. We're just getting used to some things here. But when you do get to that point where you're putting that first roll of film in your in your camera, what you're going to do is you're going to write down, okay, first exposure, my aperture was an f4, my shutter speed was one sixtieth of a second. And yeah, it doesn't look like a sixtieth. Let's see here. Distance from subject and focal length. Okay. Now this is where the reason why I'm having you do this is because I want you to see how different settings create different things visually, and then hopefully you can then begin to s connect. You know, shallow depth of field with uh, a close proximity to a, a subject. So let's say I'm I'm going to do five feet from a subject. Okay, light quality, I'm going to say it was cloudy. And you're going to turn these into me, all right? Now, the reason why I'm having you do this is be, for twofold. One, I want you to really be studying your exposures. Two, when you turn this in and I see problems with your projects, with your assignments, it allows me to better troubleshoot things, okay? And then cut line information. All this, you know, you want to write that down. So if you take a photograph that has someone in it, write down who it was, uh, what what's going on in the photograph, when was the photograph taken, where was the photograph taken, the date, you know, whatever, all right? So you're going to fill this out for each project, all right? Now, I know that seems silly and really labor-intensive, but the idea here is that I want you to slow down and be much more deliberate about how you uh, change your or create your images now. The other thing I want to uh, talk to you guys about is Full stops. I expect that you're going to shoot manually for this class, and you're always going to use full stops. And in the lecture, it talks about why I'm specifying full stops, and that means you're going to have to remember, you know, like a quarter of a second, eighth, fifteenth, thirtieth, sixtieth, one hundred and twenty-fifth, etc. Apertures. 2.8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, etc. Okay, uh, ISOs 100. Most for those of you shooting film, you're not going to be able to change your ISO 400, etc. Now, it is important that you shoot standard. Uh, ISOs, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, stops, because uh, that's going to help you with reciprocity. If you're trying to calculate uh, third and half stops, uh, half in your head, you are going to be sunk on reciprocity, okay? So the reason why I'm requiring full stops is because I'm trying to encourage you guys to really slow down and try to envision and you know create image images instead of just like creating snapshots and that's what the big there's a big difference here when you hear people talk about uh making images versus taking images and i used to think that that was actually kind of this weird uh pretentious concept and it's not at all uh taking photographs is you know just drive-by shooting you're just you're showing people what they would have seen if they had been there at that moment, shooting their camera on automatic, you know, at the roughly the same height that you are. Making a photograph is taking the time to see, taking the, the time to think about and try to apply meaning. And that's a much bigger deal. That, and that gives us the ability to create images that are much stronger, that tell stories, that people emotionally connect with, all right? So I know that it, for some of you, this is probably overwhelming. This I'm giving, I'm throwing so much information at you at, you at once. Uh, but, it, you know, we're, we're going to keep hammering away at this until you guys are really comfortable with those cameras and uh, hopefully then begin to really change the way you take photographs. 
All right, I am finally to the end of that. And that was about half an hour longer than I thought I wanted it to be. So hopefully uh, you guys, you know, uh, it wasn't too painful for you. All right, uh, as always, communicate, email me, call me, uh, you know, visit me during the, the uh, my office hours. Uh, I want to hear from you guys. So uh, have fun and enjoy the rest of your week.